Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I also wanted to say that after tonight's uh, presentation by Rosette Galt, there are some uh, books over uh, on the table by the uh, uh, wall there. And if you are interested in having one of her books, she will autograph all of those books. So if you can't make up your mind tonight that you want one, you could probably go to the bookstore in the next few days and find one. So I want to add my thank yous, uh, as well as those that were expressed by uh, Jacob and Jenna for the uh, funding for tonight's uh, lecture. I think we're so fortunate uh, here at Iowa State to have the richly diverse colleges and the departments that support programs uh, like this, programs of exploration and of invention. Art, like science, makes the invisible visible. And in so doing, art works to create human culture, and it thereby connects us to our greater humanity. The integrated studio arts students have the opportunity to be part of this intertwined exploration, making their explorations of multidisciplinary studies come together in dynamic and new ways to present experiences uh, to the viewers of their work. And now let me talk a little bit about tonight's speaker. Rosette Galt is one of my heroes. The field that we both work in, uh, art ceramics, is replete with technical experts, people who can do anything that has already been done before in clay or with glaze or with different kinds of firings. Once in a great while, though, someone comes along with a really new idea, a true innovation. In addition to the MF degree that she holds, she has a patent for her development of paper clay. In recent years, she has been investigating the potential use of paper clay for water filtration in areas of the world where clean water is not available. You know, I'm thinking maybe we could have used her in Ames this summer, huh? I think so. She has traveled extensively, uh, presenting workshops in Denmark, Canada, Finland, New Zealand, and Australia, and was recently in China, and has also worked in Nicaragua uh, along with Ron Rivera of Potters for Peace. It's a group that does a lot of work in developing nations uh, to take the ceramic technology that exists there and bring it to a higher level to improve the quality of life for the people who live there. Uh, we were talking about how ceramics combines the scientific and technical understandings with inventive personal expression, our form of ceramics, which is art ceramics. I say this in case there are some ceramic engineers in the room. Her personal work expresses a deeply felt connection to, multivalent, to a multivalent world lived experiences that are combined with intuitive insights, personal iconography, and very rich surfaces. Would you please join me in welcoming Rosette Galt? Testing, can you hear me okay? Okay, thank you Ingrid. Thank you, everybody, um, forward thinkers here at Iowa State, in a way, because you have an integrated arts program, and you're beginning to put the pieces together with these disciplines, and beginning to start to have those dialogues that we're going to have to have for the future. If we don't have them now, where are we going to have them? <laughs> Something got into me. I don't know what. But all of a sudden, it was like, it must have been that last flood, and you just had one here. I, I just went, well, this is outrageous. We have this computer, and we cannot solve this water issue. Now, it was sort of like an accident on the way to the, I don't know what. I was, you know, ac uh, inventions are like that. We knew we could mix paper and clay before, but we didn't know there was a sweet spot. Now I'm calling it the sweet spot. 
That is to say, an optimum balance of ratio of cellulose fiber, which is the fundamental uh, ingredient in paper and clay. So my talk will kind of review, uh, review that from the, my best guess, <laughs> my vision, I guess, the science side of me. But uh, mostly I was on the way as a, searching for a medium and a material. I was wanting clay to do what it wouldn't do. Uh, I was wanting it to fly, I guess. I was wondering why it, wouldn't have, it didn't have certain properties. I might have been wondering them since I was seven years old. Yeah, I think I'll say, yeah, I was wondering. Like when you're a little kid and you're given this little lump of clay to work with, this was how it all started. And you go, oh, and you, you have a ball with this thing. And you make this little thing. And then you, everybody done that? Most of you? At least a little? And then you look at it, and then, well, you come back next day. And you pick it up, and it falls apart in your hand. And you go, who, you know, why is it falling apart? What happened? And then the teacher says, I'm sorry, you're going to have to start all over again. And I thought, there's something wrong with this picture. But I had no idea that actually I'd started the question, why, along, uh, that young. And then in graduate school, I'm asking questions. This is 19, uh, early 70s, mid 70s, early mid 70s. You know, why isn't clay doing what I, I expected it to do? And they said, oh, the answer would be very expensive. And if it was, they wouldn't tell you and where. So we just had a ways to go. That was 40 years ago. So I wanted to uh, pull together. Uh, so I, I worked 20 years with regular ceramic, you know, the normal ceramics, enough to know to master it really, uh, uh, the porcelain end of it, and to work out glazes and surface. And uh, I thought, oh, well, we knew that we had, could add paper. We could, knew we could add fiber to clay to make it stronger, a tensile strength. And I didn't like adding fiber to clay. In fact, I was very opinionated about it. But uh, I thought, what if I use recycled paper and add the fiber, fiber from recycled paper into my clay? Now, I had no idea how much to add or what. I reckoned I couldn't add more than too much, because if I added too much, the clay would be, when it fired, the paper burns away, but the clay stays. So wherever there were paper fibers in the clay, they will remain. And, uh, so that day, it was a very big accident where I accidentally uh, had a crack. And I thought, if this is the end of my piece, typically in ceramics, it would be the end. And uh, I patched it with the paper clay that I had on. Um, there was a slurry of the mix. And I, uh, I patched it bone dry with this uh, clay. And I fully expected it to crack again, because if it had been normal clay, it would have. But so I didn't pay any attention to it, came back the next day and looked at it, and it was all dry again, and it was healed. So this is a healing clay. So that was 20 years ago. And uh, then I had a, a bunch of other thoughts about this. Um, but nobody believed me in ceramics, really, at the time, because what I was, say what I was advocating, the properties of the material, were unknown. And, and, and definitely not worth taking the risk, because you would lose the piece if you didn't lose it and didn't build it correctly when you were at the certain right stage. It would certainly not be a strong join when you're making a bond with it uh, during the fire. So it turns out that it's, it's a, uh, it has all these extra properties that we didn't know. And I thought, hmm, well. Uh, then people encouraged me to get patent. And of course, when I went to get patent on this, uh, of course, you know, maybe some of you have a patent in this room. You know what's involved. So you know that less than 10% of people who even have an idea that's good get a patent. Uh, but as I was in the patent search department, I was in the porous materials area. And that's how I really started to get into the engineering side of material science porous. <laughs> Now, meantime, we have a lot of material science in ceramics for our glaze chemistry. We use the periodic chart. We, we work with uh, raw materials. And we turn those raw materials into beautiful glazes. And it's not easy. 
and it used to be a lot of glaze secrets and a lot to it. So, so it's a sort of a seat of the pants kind of engineering. But I wanted to share, uh, share the results from the lab. So <laughs> with you, because I think you, someone in this audience, at least one person, I pray, has, uh, has been working on something either very similar or close enough that they can connect the dots here. Or the dialogues could start between somebody here with one another and start asking questions, such as, uh, I got on the airplane to come here. Like, I've been studying my buns off to figure out for this class, because this is new for me. Uh, and I thought, I wonder if there's an engineer. <laughs> I, need, I, need a, I need an engineer about exhaust admissions because of firing the kilns. And wouldn't you know, I'm sitting next to one on the plane. So he gave me the crash course. So I immediately integrated it into here. But anyway. So you don't know we're like two degrees of separation. If there's a missing piece to something you've thought about or how these things go. So um, I decided that, um, that the only, that either I would, uh, that paper clay itself, the, the wonderful properties of the material, would either I would die <laughs> and nobody would know about them or I would die after, or they, people would enjoy them after I died. Probably, it would take that long to uh, to share this because it was pretty radical. <laughs> but fortunately, 20 years later, I went all I got invited all over the dang planet. Word of mouth. Uh, so I ended up in one year visiting eight countries, top year schools. You know, everything from Denmark's design school to the Victoria and Albert was all them, to Harvard to you know different places, so I was planting seeds. <laughs> and all those seeds now, 20 years later, you see all this artwork uh, in my fourth edition of my book, uh, which is the blue one. And you also see it in earlier editions. But now you really see the artists are doing what I thought they could. I am so pleased, 20 years later. And I mean, now it's enough in the art scene that I don't need to be around. It, people have finally starting to get it. There's a few people who are going, oh, I get it. Oh, I'm free <laughs> to make th forms that they always wanted to make. So what this means is that not only do we have in, uh, modeling developments in CAD modeling and math, but now we have in the material world a parallel reality for the hands-on kinesthetic modelers. Because now, kinesthetically, we have a cheap modeling material that has properties, very special properties, uh, unusual. So we'll go into a little bit about what they are. But now, now we can uh, envision things and streamline manufacture and cut costs and work out all kinds of engineering problems if we need to in a low cost way with very eco-sustainable materials. So we're talking about very, uh, in some ways, well, kids might think, oh, this has been around so long. I'm not even 20 yet, you know. But what we really is a very infancy of um, from what this material could in time be. So that was part of my challenge is globally <laughs> to try to simplify it for you. Anyway, uh, let me quickly sort of uh, go through and not spend too much time, but I do want to go through some of to bring my, give you an idea of the bigger problem and where, where ceramic filtration fits into it. Because, because it's a big problem and we all share it, as you know. Is it a basic human right or not? Let's, you know, if we're going to have an investigation, let's ask the right questions. If I said it earlier today, if we don't ask the right questions, then we aren't going to get the right answer. So that is always the problem. So who doesn't get access to clean water? So then I thought, let's just look at where the water is on the planet, where we have lots of it, and where we don't. And I won't spend too much time on this, because you can go find this online. But just know that it's not necessarily where the deserts are. Therefore, there's a disconnect between the geography and the social uh, situation. And I will just say that for now. So we have a major social issue, too. It's not just a technical issue. 
So we ought to look at uh, what kind of desert there is. And there's this fantastic, National Academy of Sciences has an excellent web website on this with every piece of data on water technology, should you get interested into this, that you want to. And I just have clicked one of theirs, which I love this map, which is uh, the access to safe drinking water in 2002. But you can compare what it was 30 years ago. So we do see improvements. But you can see the darker the, um, the, darker the color, the, the harder it is. At least that's the 2002 data. So I wanted to quantify, like in ceramics, we can talk. But we, uh, our stuff has to go through the kiln. So we can't BS too much, you know, really. And we get humbled a lot, so <laughs> I'm ready for that, too. So uh, somebody else in another website did, uh, did, did where the, uh, mapped out all the wars that have been fought over war, over water. So, so we don't want to start any more wars if we can avoid it. It's a conflict. So I, I would say that there's some unworkable systems that are bogging down progress that are out of date, but we have to figure out what the good bits are to keep. <laughs> and uh, we have to find the missing pieces. And so we will continue. So the outcome, what we've learned so far. I want you to see the state of the art right now of where water filtration is in third world countries. So we know what we're designing for. So we can really begin to hone down where it's needed and where we don't need it. So thirsty, OK? So here we have all kinds, public and private. There are a lot of people very outraged about the fight over whether those are public or private. I will leave that for another talk, not me. But when you get on that particular website, if you wanted safe drinking water, you would have all these technologies. I won't list them all. You can go online to find them. What I want to do is give you all the tools to go to where you need to go to get what you need to know. But there's a lot out there. So we have really cool technology now. There's a lot of good stuff that's out there. We want to integrate the best of their understanding. And even the corporates are getting into it. After all, it's getting to be the big buzzword. There's been enough social pressure. Even Pepsi. Now, anyone's been in third world countries knows that they have a better uh, distribution system than the church. And there's Coke bottles and Coke trucks. They keep everybody supplied with sugar water. Now, there's an infrastructure that already exists. Maybe we can talk them into cooperations. They seem to be maybe willing. They've already got a lot of some of the technical details worked out. Why should we have to do it twice? Why should we be competing to make a basic need? So that's them. We have filtration systems. We have tons of companies into the business, you know, uh, big and small. And, you know, you've got Filter Pure, you've got Braun, the kinds we use. There's all these, uh, even Procter & Gamble, all kinds of big companies into it. You can also find this online. Um, and I will skip over this for the time, but there, there's really, uh, do we have any checks and balances uh, in terms of, keeping the greed of if the product was developed, who would have access to it, and who would set the price, and how would we keep the price low enough, and what about all the middlemen? And somebody pointed out last week as I was preparing for this talk, the middlemen don't have any moral code. They don't care because they don't have to answer to customers. They're not seen. Pepsi has to answer to customers. And the creator has to enter it, but the middlemen don't. So some of them can hide, hide and just say, it's tough, I won't let, that, I won't let you import your, uh, your insecticide into my company, you know, your biocide, your silver nitrate, or in, into my company unless you pay me graft, whatever. So you get all those problems. We're just part of it. And there's lots of fur further study. These are some possible uh, further places to go afterwards, I can tell you. And more study, and more study. So that puts the issue in um, a kind of a global sense. And then, OK, but now let's bring it home to what occurred to me. What happens here? <laughs> or in, in, in Seattle, where I'm from, or any. What happened? OK, going to wash your hands with what? Your hands are going to get contaminated. And then you're going to touch everything that gets contaminated. Right? And here is this open water thing. Some soap and water will help. Um, 
the biggest problem when I've talked to Potters for Peace uh, manufacturers who are in um, all these development, they're about, they're, I think I have data here from 10 countries, different uh, developing countries where they're building ceramic water filters, which we're going, is where we're going. Um, they, uh, they say that the, this is, recontamination as the field is one of the major problems to have to design around. So if you're a designer, here are the puzzle pieces that you're going to be having to synthesize these issues and see what you can come up with. The challenge is, or has been, and we'll see how they were solved so far in some pretty cool solutions that have cues for the future. And it might be with paper clay or it may not, or paper clay might have some part to do with it or it may not. I think it might have something to do with it, but I'm not sure exactly. Okay, so there's a different kind. Here's, if you had, say, for this with the Red Cross would tell you, put bleach in it. You know, I hear, okay, <laughs> say boil the water, okay, fine if you have fuel. And uh, what about the water containers? All of these issues, we don't have so much issue with, but boy, in a third world country, this is a big deal. They have it every day. So we need uh, some kind of container that will interfere with microbe and container, contaminant growth. Now how do filters work? The ones that we see today, they found the best systems are uh, layer systems. So they're multiple filters. So the water will have to pass through all these different screens and as each one takes out a certain kind of contaminant. I think this is probably the way we'll end up doing it. I don't know, but it's a pretty good idea. It, it's, these guys have been working on this for a while, so they must know something. And I you know, want you to know that that's how they do it. And I want you to be able to go. Uh, stock up. We got cash. You can just get what you need. But not anybody can. You'll see all these different designs, water filter, just a Google search on the image, right? You know, and there's tanks, which of course the tank kind will protect the, uh, the, the filter from getting contaminated. There's all sorts of designs. And how much do they cost? $99, $349, uh, $34.95 for the Brita. Hmm. Does it cost that much, a Brita down in Nicaragua? I don't think so. And then you have to buy the filter thing over and over and over again, right? That's uh, a year's salary for some people. Well, anyway, this is the reality check. So what we're going to do, suppose the power, so we want to have the cost down. So that would be another uh, design factor. Uh, suppose the power fails. So what if the water pumps don't work? Then what happens? Do we, which is a priority? So we need to have some low tech, i.e. low power use options in case the power fails and the water's contaminated, which is every day in some parts of, like in Nicaragua when I went, the power went out a lot. They just kept overloading the power thing. The town, and maybe you've been in, in different countries where power is not on every all the time like it is here more or less. What is available? There's this ultra fine top cloth called a life straw. Ever heard of it? It's an ultra fine weave that's micron thin weave of nylon. So it's not. It's using man-made material coming out of Denmark. It strains bacteria pretty well. It catches them mechanically. <laughs> and everybody thinks this is pretty clever. Of course, it's a man-made material. Is it a biodegradable? material? Biodegradable material? Maybe not. But it does do the job. So it's very interesting. And here's more about it. And you can see it's called disease control textiles. You can look up more about those. Here's more about the life straw, how it works. You can go online and find out more about it. Then they have something really cool, I think, high-tech ultraviolet light pen. And this is a little battery-powered unit that you stick like you see the thing and you dip it in the water and it's got UV light and the UV light kills the microbes. And you can carry those if you have a battery. I mean, these are some pretty cool inventions people have got. Then somebody's doing sun treatment, laying things out in the sun. And I'm thinking, hmm, how could you combine low tech with the sun? So uh, some of the ceramic filtrations, there's two kinds right now. There's the bucket style, which is what we're going to look at here. And there's called the candle style, which were the kinds you see in your campers that, the, that, we, that, are, that are candle, uh, that are like this. They fit in. 
they, they fit in here like uh, this is a candle style or this is a candle style or this is a candle. It's a little chunk, you know, that would fit in and you can, uh, you can stick a hose in here and suck, uh, suck water through it as a reverse osmosis thing and, and the output would be clear. But, or input, uh, but mostly that way. They have some designs on this, not so many, but some. And then they have activated charcoal, and this is going into what's inside. Go and find out what's inside. You get in, interested in this subject, keep going and go find out. This is down in Nicaragua, the filters, the candle filters, so you can see how they look. And you see they need, um, they need to be cleaned and scrubbed. Anybody been camping with a water filter knows. Or they need some kind of sleeve to protect them from getting microbes, uh, recontamination in the field. The guys down there say the biggest trouble is at the spigot. Um, another problem that they have is adhesive between the ceramic and the other materials. And this is another really cool uh, uh, candle uh, low-tech uh, research project being done in India. I can give you more information about it. Uh, this is uh, probably, I, I don't know for sure if it's using sawdust as a burnout or rice husks. And here are more uh, types of candle uh, filters, gold standard. Go find out more about them if you get into this. There are uh, pump systems. This is a bicycle pump, MIT guy friend, maybe anybody know? And he's pumping well with his feet like this. And this is um, Hank, um, Hank Verst, Hartstack. Anyway, he is, uh, he's got a hand pump there and that's a, a reverse osmosis filter. There's a YouTube, you can read more about him. And you dip that filter in the scuzz water and then pump and out comes the tube, like I was describing here. Only that's what his looks like. And this is the arty view. This is my little, what if they were arty, artistic. You know, right now they're kind of looking, looking very engineering like. They don't really look beautiful. I'm an advocate for for a way that these things could be both practical and absolutely gorgeous cultural artifacts that could be collectibles and have a plan for the use after they've been filtrated. But anyway. And then here, oh wow, is this light? It doesn't look, it looks so different. This is, uh, this is sawdust. And this is the wood that they make, chip the sawdust down at the, uh, the filter factory in Nicaragua where I went to do a test batch of the first paper clay. And uh, uh, this is the debris of the spent filters. And you can see that in some situations, it's a pretty funky arrangement here. <laughs> and the dust from the sawdust is a real lung problem. But they need, uh, they use the splitter ends and the, the sawdust that's refuse. And they have to find a way to get the sawdust into the clay. And they have to sieve that through sieves and things. I'll show you, but so that's, uh, what we used, um, uh, sawdust and rice husks and sometimes coffee grains have, have been used in the ceramic filtration typically to make the porous material. You stir those in, which are readily available in low tech places, and then uh, they are granulated on the hole, and then the uh, firing makes a little pour open hole, opens it up. Now those pores from those are too big to catch a microbe, so we'll tell you what they do. Oop. Well, anyway, here's what you, here's a, here's the bucket style filter. This is the factory. We're gonna go see in Nicaragua how it happens. Uh, but what happens, it's like a gravity feed and it fits in a bucket, like a five gallon bucket. And you, and you have the uh, ceramic uh, pot in there, clay filtering element with a lid put the water in it, and the receptacle collects the water, and then there's a spigot at the bottom of the spec, uh, the receptacle. And this is telling how to clean it and everything what it is. And here's how to do it again. So here are the spigots. Guess what happens when they got the plastic bucket for these, which they used to all be ceramic, but PVC is everywhere in the third world now. Uh, everybody started using the bucket for a bucket. And the buckets got separated from the filter pretty fast in practice because people needed the bucket. And they don't, un they don't kind of get the filter idea yet. Uh, here's uh, more instructions on these different buckets in different countries. 
And these are some of the, uh, this is the, a report that just ta came out uh, in September. That's a ceramic uh, manufacturer, uh, filter manufacturer's uh, uh, report of all the filters. They've got a group together since Ron Rivera died of malaria. Two weeks he died. He was completely healthy, emailed me, said, let's do another test. And I'm like, yeah, I'm in Denmark right now. When I get back, I'll schedule another trip, and we'll do another test. And I, he was dead before I got back. And that's how virulent right, malaria is in Africa. And he ought to know better. He goes there. He got it. I went, whoa. Ho, ho. Anyway, they're Cambodia, Asia, different factories. So you can see that the, the retail price is down here under $10 for most of them and a few places a little lower. They would sure like to bring the price down. They say the most highest price that they have is importing the um, colloidal silver, which is what they use to, have to, to, to dip the ceramic in after, to give it a bath, uh, and impregnate the, the clay with a, with a biocide or a, uh, or a uh, a chemical that discourages microbe growth there. So this is, uh, of course, some idea of the filter production. On, and you can see these factories are very small. And the idea is that the factories be regional, be small, and be very local so that your materials aren't very expensive to bring and they aren't very costly. That You use the local whatever's around locally if you can. So there we're we going. And here we go in uh, India. Uh, where um, there are, you know, not everywhere in the third world is, is dirt, dirt. Here's a dirt floor that's a work of art, I think. They sweep it every day. And these are pots. This is their, this is in uh, Bengal. And you, oh, I didn't have a chance to adjust the light. It looked okay on my monitor, but not so great on this. Uh, but, the, but it doesn't mean just because you live on a dirt floor that it's uh, dirty, necessarily. But, but it can be really dusty and dirty. And what I noticed when I've traveled, and the only uplifting thing to me was the artwork and the folk art. And in India, they're always decorating and blessing and praying, and they decorate the doors. And no matter how poor they are, they are able to find a way to make what they have beautiful to them in their way. And I thought, yeah, beauty is a form of wealth that's accessible to everybody, and it's inside everybody, and, and it can cut the edge. Uh, it certainly has been doing traditionally. This is a river. This is typically not, this is in India, typically where the, ba the bathing happens, and um, there's a woman taking a bath down there, which I don't think, um, you can see, but I'll carry on and keep going, but you get with the idea. <laughs> and they do the wash. And this has been done for, for a long time. And, it's, and the stoves. This is an Indian stove. Uh, and they decorate those. And the ceramic stoves, they also, if they want, they, they use a, they need to be what's called a, a refractory because the, 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 the fire, if it's too hot, will cause it to crack. But if it's a paper clay, they can handle the, the heat, because that's one of the properties of paper clay when it's fired, is it can handle thermal shock a lot better than a typical clay can. But maybe also so can uh, sawdust. I don't know for sure. But they must, I, I would imagine they're using some kind of fiber. Those Indians were using fiber before. They just didn't call it paper clay, maybe. I don't know. But they have these cool stoves. Just plant that idea. Some people are in there designing ceramic stoves. These are applications for ceramics outside of the field of art. This is Ron Rivera at his desk. I wish I could see all the beautiful artwork. There, he took me and showed me not just the factories there, but all the beautiful handcrafts, of which they were abundant. And you can see up there, uh, even one of someone gave, made a pot for him with a burnished glaze. And look, there's a water filter. Can you see the water filter factory? So, so people really, um, God, what is causing this? Uh, I don't think it's, I think it's something 
we couldn't have, I didn't predict this, and now I know in future. Unfortunately, you can hardly see it. This is Manny Hernandez. Uh, this is a bucket style, so there's an, I mean, uh, um, what I call the ellipse egg style, and that's an ellipse-shaped uh, bucket filter. And so uh, uh, you can see it's being pressed with a hydraulic press, and that's from one of the factories. And here's Ron and everybody getting ready to take me to the factory. And these are some of the uh, handcrafts. I'm tossing in a few of the handcrafts around there because you can see they are great with their hands. And they also are showing, they know the ceramic processes. And they can make anything almost with their hands on clay. But you know, you're going along and there's the family pig who's a family pet. And he's just down there <laughs> in the ground. <laughs> you know? And there, where's the pet pooping? You know? <laughs> and where's, you know? And this is kind of what it looks like in the back there. Anybody been? I mean, and uh, this is inside, you know. And you know what? You go inside in some of the houses, not all of them, but have cell phones, have computers, have sorts of stuff we wouldn't expect. This is, I wish you could see it. This is inside the average kit kitchen nowadays. Look, there's plastic. 30, 40 years ago, there was none of that plastic around. So. This is a new thing that they've got used to, that uh, instead of pots or, or tin can, pans and stuff like that. However, this gives you an idea of the sort of environment that if people were going to design filters for, that it needs to be compatible with a culture and culturally right and maybe co-developed with each culture uh, because I don't think it will be adopted <laughs> if not. Here's more handcraft at home. Uh, because where I'm going with this is that there's a whole group of people who work at home who could make the parts if they wanted for a job and not have to go to a factory because paper clay production can be changed. So not all the pieces have to be assembled when they're leather hard. They can be assembled when they're dry to dry. So parts could be made, beautiful parts could be made and brought to the place and assembled dry to dry instead of having to keep them wet or worry about any of this. So we have uh, ways that uh, whoever is living there could make their water filters gorgeous. <laughs> These are the kind of old uh, ovens that there are and the kind of funky firing set setups. And this is inside a house. Um, so you can see televisions are in some of the homes. Quite uh, is surprising to not all, but some. They're the, uh, maybe some of them are the cast-offs from our culture. Who knows? But they're part of it. So what would our ancestors say? What would they say? Wise up. Use your resources. Common sense. Look around. See what you have to work with. We gave you life. You were created in love. and I mean, we were created in love, and you also, maybe. I, I was thinking, what would they want to tell me? as far as this, that we, we can solve this. We absolutely can, but we are going to have to find a few new missing pieces in order to do it. So here are some of the visions that I got from talking to the water filter people in ceramics, what they want. So then I'm going to talk about the challenge to this as it relates uh, down what we did at the Nicaragua factory. So you'll know uh, where we stand in this. They want the cost down so that everybody, rich or poor, could have in kitchens. Like everybody has pots and pans and bowls. Everybody can have water filters. Uh, or some kind of sy system. We'll call it the water filter system. It should be low tech, low tech in case of no electricity or low power. Uh, it should be sustainable, eco-friendly manufacturer with low or zero carbon footprint made with renewable renewable ed energy sources. Now, the bioside people are busy, hard at work, too. They, everybody wants an instant marker. So it's easy to tell what is safe, and uh, it should be visible and fast, you know, like pregnancy testing or something like that. How fast is, is it or isn't it safe for me to use this filter? So they're working on this, but they haven't got it solved yet, and certainly not solved in chemical engineering uh, yet, but that's a project we're going, we're shooting for. 
because then you'll know the filter's good. And some people have solved it by just saying, look, let's just use the filter once, and they're once used, then they're never to be used again. Now, that's one way we could go. But then we'd have disposable filters, so we should design those filters so they should be end use. Uh, uh, cultural and social systems integration. So the artifacts could be full of cultural variety and could be uh, totally something that's unique to each part of the world. Let's not have the same art from everywhere in the world. <laughs> and they could be art things, like if somebody dug them up, they go, what did they use those for? Oh, <laughs> lightweight, portable. Uh, likely there'll be a hybrid of low tech and extreme high tech. Uh, so stuff that is possible now that was not possible earlier is what I think it's going to be. And paper clay, technology will paper clay technology will play some kind of a role as the properties of the material will mimic those, a greater range of the materials of legacy clay. So that's lowest. Look, we want to keep the cost down. We need renewable power. And these are some of the renewable power things from um, Ron uh, Rivera uh, showed me. Um, wells, just to give you know, wind power, uh, turbo power, uh, pedal power. <laughs> I love these kind of gadgets, right? Some of them could be very artistic indeed. So what do we have? Oh, um, we have you know, oil filters, right? And we have oil air filters, and we have uh, 3D CAD, and we have laser cuts. These are just some of the technologies that we have that we didn't have 40 years ago. We have these to, to use. And you can do a design in, in CAD on your computer and then have the, this cut it. And paper clay is cuttable if you wanted to cut it in paper clay. But you, they're still working that out. This is a CAD uh, design that you can rotate and move it around. Uh, even something as simple as a hose end, if the, suppose the filter was at the end of the hose like this. Look at the technology in a hose. I had no idea. If you started looking at how those uh, rings swing together, God, this is really neat. So well engineered. So these kind of joints and ways to hook and unhook might be something we could use or could be transferred over. And I went and said that already. And we need the instant measurement messengers. Oh, yeah. Somehow something got, well, anyway. Uh, so here are the instant messengers that we have. Um, there's also just stuff that we can do, like fixing leaky pipes and agricultural issues, which, by the way, for agriculture, for drip irrigation, who knows? The paper clay filters could be used to help regulate uh, the water flow when irrigating. As a, as a, as a, uh, uh, that's another one we could do. And we need to reclaim the kiln fire by byproducts. This is the guy on the plane. Oh. The, the uh, fumes from the kiln. <laughs> so we ha in case, like up here, we have to have now emissions tests, the EPI. We didn't used to have this. They don't have this down in the third world. But everybody's going to get there sooner or later. So we need to know how much the emissions are different from legacy clay, for a, a paper clay, because it has more carbon material. And if they are incomplete combusted CO, then we have to know exactly when they are and why they are and how to not be, or if we can do anything about it. Volatile organic compounds, if they're that, then like some of that reclaimed material, especially the plasticizers, might give those. Plastic will give those. Those have to be treated in the stack, smokestack emissions control system. There are more costs involved in that in a factory. You have to figure out how how to monitor the system and how to set it up and how to keep it going and everything like that. Uh, traditional clay does give off gases, so they've got these scrubbers well worked out, but we may need those guys. We may need those. We may need a heat exchanger system and take advantage of when they are firing kilts. What can we do with the heat? Because it hot air, could it be reclaimed, right? Could it be, maybe you guys know, battery charger, refrigerant, small propellers to stir the paper? We need, um, we need some way to fuel the paper mixing project, which I'll show you in a minute. And if we don't have that, we, ha we need something to propel that. Well, maybe while the kilns are firing, that's a good time to have the pulp be mixing. Because pulp doesn't have to, when you're reclaiming um, 
recycled paper, you have to turn it back to pulp, and you need to agitate it in some way, and you need to agitate it for just about as long as a kiln is firing. So why not take the kiln fire somehow and translate that into the motor somehow that's a low energy motor, but it agitates the pulp water? Things like beginning to start to pull these together. Um, and then what about reclaiming that post-consumer debris? And we've got to reclaim it. I mean, we can't just ignore it. In a way, we've got to go gather the trash that is there at some level. Uh, what are we going to do with this stuff? Well, we might find some end use for it that is less uh, degradable to the environment, perhaps. Maybe we will use it for flooring for houses or something reason. Something that keeps it from being debris all over the landscape. Forty years ago, when I went to uh, all through South America at that time, uh, there was debris everywhere. Uh, but it was pa paper. And the paper is well long gone. Now there are plastic bags and crud everywhere. And that is not going to go away. Ugly little blue bits, you know. What is this? Oh, these are just the recycling from Seattle. And they were, they, we have a big program. You probably have one here. Food, if food is on your recycled paper, you can't use it, right? Something like that. Or they can't process it. Here's recycled paper. Just to give a reality of it. Somebody's saying that China won't take it anymore. What, what is that? Who was telling me? China is used all the recycled paper that they can. They've bought it from us for a long time. We were shipping it off in bales like this, and they, could, they had a use for it. And now they don't have a use for it anymore. So now we have all these bales of reclaimed paper. What are we going to do with them? But they're all full of those plastic inks and uh, printing press debris, um, plastic. Now they have a lot more plastics on pr printing than they ever used to, foils. And those things are quite difficult uh, for uh, a third world place or a low tech ar arrangement uh, to separate from the cellulose fiber. In other words, this is cellulose impregnated with plastics which will generate one heck of an ugly, volatile fume if it got used. So this wasn't the case uh, in 1990, but it is something to face now. So it's part of the puzzle we have to sort with. Um, this is in the back of my book. These are the kinds of recycled paper that you can use and how you would sort it and what to do with it when we put it in the, in the paper clay. And this is my little. Um, I, uh, I just thought, you know, it's a seed idea. Okay, it's just like one of those seed images. Because I, I, I saw that, that, that uh, water filter that um, Hank had designed with a the, with the pump that you, you dip it in the uh, scuzz water and then you pump out with a hose, right? And I went, yeah, but it's ugly. What if they were beautiful? And what if artists did them? And I thought, well, they're going to need a little stand, something on the bottom, because there's sludge and crud at the bottom of the bucket. So if you get into designing these, you have to have a little stand on them. <laughs> and then the little cap. I just put straws, but those could be a hose leading anywhere. Uh, but then they have, of course, some kind of interface between the hose adhesive has to happen between the hose and the filter. So the caps can be, if they were designed, can be manufactured uh, wet, but then they can be uh, dry joined, dry to dry. And so there can be uh, multiple things inside these filters, too. There are a lot of possible uh, directions to this, but this was just a sense of, uh, hmm, if I was in a kitchen somewhere, and somebody came along and wanted me to use a water filter, and it was ugly, forget it. I would always go for the more beautiful one. And I would actually always go for the one that was made by somebody I knew in my town. So that is a possibility now. Or perhaps the water filter is functional, but it slides into a cup, say, like this. Well, yeah, so this would be the cup. And the filter fit in like that, see? But instead of it being ugly PVC pipe, which it could be, 
this would be the beautiful thing, and this would be just the functional filter that fits in. So I was thinking about all these different arrangements where the exterior was a glazed ceramic that is, or a, a burnished ceramic that is not necessarily paper clay, and then there's paper clay, or a lobe type of paper clay, and the inside is very high pulp paper clay. Anyway, you get the idea that it doesn't, it can be many layers of different uh, uh, mixtures of paper clay that it could be. I thought, you know, they have extrusion tubes, you know what an extruder, and it squirts out uh, a clay in, a tu in, it squirts it out in a continuous hose like this, <laughs> and you need dyes to do this, right? So it comes out in a hose, so I got a couple of these big hoses, I thought, okay, I'm in the third world, and somebody's hand squirted one of these. And then I thought, well, what could I make out of these that doesn't look like this? And I thought, boy, in my hand work, I just crimped the bottom here to make it stand up, and crimped the top, and now you can put the, the, the straw in. That isn't too hard for anybody to do. It takes you about as long to take it off the take it off the uh, extrusion tool as to crimp it and make, this is the really simple one. Or perhaps it would look like this. You know, it's coming off the tube and it's soft and you grab it and then you pinch the ends and boom. Or, or perhaps it's another version like this. So I began to think of what we could do with very simple low-tech tools and I just wanted to plant some idea seeds of possibilities uh, with this. And I, if you'd like to see really quick, before I close, the quickly the uh, back, I, I would like to show you uh, actually what happens in Nicaragua. i am kind of decided to forego showing you my artwork. You can find it online. Or you can come and see the class. You're absolutely welcome to come into the, our laboratory imagination uh, practical uh, experimenting. Experimenting, see what this is. I brought some samples too for you to try it if you want to see what it feels like. I have some soft stuff. Uh, if you just take a small sample home just to see how it feels. Um, anyway, here we are going to the factory again. Now when you go to a factory, if you're an engineer, this is stuff you would know about. You'd have to know. Okay, what's, this is from the report. This tells all their little steps in manufacture. So we're talking about a fairly uh, labor intensive and um, process that has many stages and this is with legacy ceramics. So I am not, I'm going to advocate a little bit where we could streamline some of this. But this is the factory system uh, in when you would go probably. You would get, uh, the clay would be collected in various holding bins and dried out usually. Now typically in the classic ceramics, water was the enemy, but in, in paper clay ceramics, water is our friend. In, 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 in high tech ceramics for the last while, 10, 20 years, it's all been about dry press and getting the water out. And this is a water-based friendly situation, uh, uh, technology that uses the old water-based equipment that is given away that they can't even pay to get rid of in the first world. But all of those things, uh, machinery could be put well to use if wanted, because we will use the water well. Uh, we use the water to make the water, <laughs> and we do need a place where there is a water source in order to use it. Anyway, here's the clay, and this is uh, from the report by the manufacturer's group that just came out, which I can get you copies if you're interested. Uh, to learn everything, it's a 200-page report. Uh, and these are all the different systems, the material supply system, uh, the production system, the biocide system. I'm calling them biocides. I'm not going to call it preservative or whatever. I'm just going to call it what it is. <laughs> uh, firing kilns and all that is a whole system. And it has all sorts of technology going with that. The quality control not just going into the factory, but then how are the filters coming out, how are they tested, and then how are they distributed and packaged and sold. And that's just for starters. There's a lot of them. So the burnouts leave openings so clay goes through faster than normal. And so people might wonder, well, what does it mean 
to uh, uh, to slake clay. Where do you, how do you, what do you do with the raw clay? And I'll just go really quickly. Raw clay, what clay? Um, when it dries, it shrinks and it gets uh, into hard hard state. And when it gets wet, it expands and it's soft and gooey. And when it's in the hard state like that, it can be reconstituted into uh, the soft state by adding water. But it held, it's better if it's small chips rather than big hunk, hunky chunks. The big hunky chunks take a long time for the water to get through it, so they have to have something called a hammer mill to break these things up. So what you do is you pour water. Unfortunately, you can't see this is what, in this light, uh, this projection. But anyway, you pour water on the dry clay, and you let it sit, and it soaks up the water, and then it you pour off the residual water like it is there, and there's the wet clay. And then you stir that up into a mash, and then you let that dry a little bit, and you've got clay to hand, that's plastic clay to work with in that. So you know that that's part of their, one of their ways of making clay, I should say. This is in a, a brick factory. This plop right there, I guess I have a little pointer. I should try it. This, uh, I think the pointer is, where's the pointer? Well, I can't find it. Oh, here it is. So this is a blob of clay, <laughs> like a plop of a clay. Uh, I can see it so clearly on my screen, but it looks just like a black lump there. And these are some of the bucket filters at the factory in Nicaragua where, uh, where Rad and I uh, and another specialist, John Williams, who I brought in on for the team, um, mixed, uh, we, we substituted paper fiber for the uh, sawdust that they use in this factory. So we're in there, and this is the, the sawdust arrangement, which was really dusty. So I wanted to kind of go over what we, uh, we, we use water, and uh, because we use water, there's less dust, so the clay dust doesn't get around. And the, and the paper pulp is using a water system, too. Uh, I think, I hope I've got the right slideshow of the paper, uh, how the paper is made. But you can come over to the shop and see. Uh, so anyway, it's cooler. And uh, so you're mixing wet materials to wet materials. So you don't have to go through the drying out stage. You don't have to dry the clay out before you can use it. And you don't have to dry the pulp out before you can use it. So therefore, there's a whole piece of savings there. You can fast dry the paper clay much like, like I don't know, third faster, maybe a half as fast, maybe more, depending on what kind it is. So they're saving fuel. Also, when you force uh, paper clay dry, you don't baby it. It immediately tells you if there's any problem with your construction, you'll see a crack. And if you see a crack, you can patch the crack unlike regular clay. But you want to see the cracks, so you want to stress the pots dry. You don't want to slow dry them. Slow drying is what we did in legacy ceramics. Um, the green strength of paper clay means there's less breakage, which means it's easier to handle, less loss around the shop uh, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the factory. Uh, machine cutting is possible. I have a little saw here. The greenware is, is tough enough to saw which is also another possibility. Uh, so uh, the patching you can do, and you can use it as its own adhesive. The adhesive properties have not yet fully been explored. I have, a, I'm working on a paper explaining exactly what about these that we don't know uh, more. So uh, what are the drawbacks of the clay? The pulp reclaim might we need water, we need barrels, we need power for stirring the pulp paper to break into pulp. We might need a, a paper shredder or we need hand tearing to bring the pulp down. And we need the cost of the containers to process the pulp. And the pulp should not be made a whole lot too soon ahead of time before it's put into the clay. So we don't know the emissions regulation and we don't yet know really the post-production functionality tech technology in yet. But these are all the lists of advantages to it, and I won't go over. I'm, oh, here. Oh, good. I, I, where did I put this? So here's shredding the paper. <laughs> we should have gone through the whole slideshow as a preview. Now I nerd. Sorry. I just looked at the first two slides in it and thought, oh. 
Anyway, here's just, we, but we got a paper shredder. Here's the Managua newsprint. And these were the barrels that we had handy out back. Filled them with water. And then here's whipping them with a drill, much like we did today in class. Uh, the the um, newsprint. And there's it when it first started. And there it is, getting better. But it takes time. It seemed like forever that we were getting this. But we got it down finally. And we're sieving it out uh, with the bags or with that uh, strainer just reserving out of the pulp water wet, sloppy pulp that's kind of like a wet dish rag or something, wet lint, you know? And oh, by the way, these are the, fat, see this filtron? There's another bucket being used for something else. That's one of the buckets that's for the, that the clay buckets, uh, the clay filter fits in. It's getting used in our, has a, in a quick pinch. Um, you can even strain the pulp with strainers as funky as these, with as many openings as that. They don't have to be fine mesh to catch the pulp. Here's some of the pulp, but you see some of the bits, the colored bits of paper, are still not yet beaten up fully or dissolved. Some inks just really hold the little fibers underneath their, them together longer and take longer to disperse. So f sometimes, uh, this is using not hot water, but hot water would probably help, but hot water would be another cost. So we have to figure out something here, I don't know. But anyway, we mixed it again, so you had to keep mixing, and now we have these buckets full of pulp, like this, and we put lids on them and put them on the back of the truck and off we went. <laughs> And um, I'm just showing you what pulp looks like in case you've not seen it. And then here I am uh, mixing pulp with a clay slurry, like a liquid clay. So we're going to add pulp to clay slurry. So the clay is very liquid when you add it. And then here is a, uh, so what we did, this is the first batch of paper clay uh, uh, using their clay, which I have a sample of here. And so we had, uh, we put a dry, dry ingredient, dry clay in there, and then we put, introduced the pulp, the wet pulp into the dry clay. And we had a, a, a beater here that was like a bread dough mixer, and it was mixing the, um, moistening the dry clay. So we're having to get, in this case, because that was their system, this is what they use. They have dry blend clay and dry sawdust, and then they added water. In this case, we added the pulpy, which was wet anyway, and the, which had water in it, very little water, and just the dry clay. This could be streamlined quite a bit, but I thought just once we see how it goes, how it presses, then we'll see what we need to do to refine. We weren't sure what recipe we needed for the right flow rate, too, because you have to figure out exactly how the water should flow for the thickness of the wall. And then, oh, I wish you could. See, so here's the hopper with a little bit of clay in it. And maybe here's my little doodah. Here, you can go here. So the hopper with the clay. And then these guys, these are not ergonomically made, which they ought to be. This should be up at a high level, right? So that when you plop the clay out, it lands on a table that's down here so you don't stress your body. Then these women are wedging the clay into, into chunks and weighing it because this is, this is the drill press over here. And they're going to clamp down. They put a blop of this on the bucket uh, mold and plop down the mold. And out comes a bucket, <laughs> a pressed bucket here, and I think. Those are the buckets around the factory uh, drying. And where's the, uh, oh. Now the first test pass, you're about to show you the mistake in the first test one. But the fourth batch was a success, that Ron said. But the first batch was not. <laughs> and here's John and Ron going, it's cracked on the edge here. Now, part of the reason it cracked is because the, the, the recipe was not high enough in the pulp we needed, uh, ratio to clay. And the other reason it cracked in part was they weren't, uh, they just, Ron didn't get what I was going with it. He hadn't really studied it, but he knew it was a good idea, intuitively. And he was expecting to use the old system. And so 
uh, there were certain aspects that got forgotten. But, th but he had figured it out by the fourth batch, which was great. Anyway, there they are. So that was our first uh, goof. What I said to him is we should force this dry, and it may be also the moisture content here needs to be wetter. So all these variables are part of the problem we've got. So you can see the level of the problem is going to take a lot of teamwork and a lot of different people. So now we need to have the flow rate right and the porosity. Here's how they test the porosity. I won't go into all of it, but you test how the flow rate, it's a way to quickly test, did you screw up the filters? So they, they need these on-site ways for quality control. So what they do is they'll measure and see how long it takes for the water to go through. And if it goes through at the right rate, at the right time, then they know the filter's good. And so they want to know, um, we don't know how many pores uh, we need. They say uh, for um, the porosity here tells, in that report, you can read much more about the porosity tolerances that it has to be. But you can, and it tells all about where they are at with the porosity. And then uh, here's another test that we need to do that I did just to show you we need to know, is the thickness going to make a difference? And we need to compare the same clay at three different thicknesses and see how the flow rate changes. Just simple tests like this that you guys could do. Here's this same test a few hours later. How is it dripping? How is it doing? I was actually really surprised it didn't go right through. I wanted it to go right through like a, a coffee filter. Anyway, these are some tests. You want to test, 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 see? So these are all details about how the test could be. Then you have to test the biocides and all of this and what's involved. This is something that the paper clay technology could eliminate. Here's what they have to do now. Each of these has to be tested <laughs> and buckets had to be made. Each filter is tested. Sometimes these are tested this way. It used to be that this was silver, uh, silver concentrate and then they started brushing the silver concentrate. But this was the way they'd run a, run, uh, run this through, regular, uh, this, this uh, fluid through, and that would uh, sell, uh, fill the bucket with the biocide that it needs so that the next, all the subsequent water after was getting the microbes killed as it went through. So it, it's, there's two countries, what, Spain, Colombia, Yemen. So <laughs> those are the four places you can get it. So, uh, and these are the providers of that silver, colloidal silver, which right now is what they're using um, at the moment. And so we need all these details figured out. <laughs> and we need, I wonder if there's some kind of natural antibiotics that we could soak these things in for some herbal plants that are around. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> So we need to figure, somebody who's mind, a, a, a mind for that could go, should check that out too. And the firing processes, uh, it says 700 to 900, very low fire. So here's the kiln. Anybody been in class? Do you know what is going on in this kiln with it looking like this? Some of you haven't been in school long enough to know this. This is what you call incomplete combustion or reducing, a reduction. There's too much fuel for the kiln. They were overstoking the kiln. Overstoking the kiln not only gives off CO, but it gives off, uh, uh, it, it actually brings the temperature of the kiln down. It's very inefficient use. So here they had their precious wood using for this and not firing efficiently. So the whole firing system has to be a lot more efficient. So we have to find a way to stoke the kiln or some way to teach people how to stoke their kilns. The whole thing of kilns and firing is a whole other future for somebody here. And here we were, that emission test. And this heat, that was the same slide. So those are some of the issues that happen to be with this. And I just wanted to kind of give you a kind of a test, taste of that, you know and invite you to, for further uh, information to find out a lot more. I think in the books you'll have an introduction if you wanted to thumb through them to see all the cool stuff the artists are doing with this material. 
Uh, but, but this application, and there may be some other applications like, and I didn't show you this, but like in, there will be in someday bone replacement. Right now, we have ceramic, bioceramics, nanoceramic, and they're working really hard on that, and they have, and also bioadhesives, all sorts of really interesting stuff. You have a department like that here? Yeah. And uh, there's the bubble ceramics, the, uh, and the fiber ceramics, but the fiber people, they, they, the engineering were saying, but cellulose isn't so great because it's irregular. And we can't control its sizes. And I uh, don't, time does not permit going into all uh, of the uh, inner workings, which if you're interested, you can see the, the inner sizes of a cellulose fiber have uh, irregularities that could be part of, you know, what is it, order and randomness, chaos theory? That where you could use the chaos of a, of a, a matrix of a paper, uh, of paper fiber or cellulose fiber in the ceramic mix. And that would, um, that would be kind of like organized chaos, but chaos used in such a way that it does the job. Now, I'm, oh, somehow in this uh, mix, and I didn't want to go on too long, so I'm not going to go into another slideshow, but uh, there is a picture here of very close-up vision, and I'm pretty sure if we do a test, an electron micrograph of it, and we do a test of it, it will prove that the, there are uh, nanopores that get created in a paper clay. And there are nanofibers around the cellulose fibers which are in the um, recycled paper or even in non-recycled cellulose. And those nanofibers are at the size of bacteria. So they could mechanically capture the bacteria. I mean, mechan what is it? Yeah, physically capture the bacteria, which might mean we won't have to use that silver nitrate. And Ron could see that. And also he was interested in developing this as, as we just, it's just a science we just don't know yet. So you guys as young people, here's what we know. And I have a ton more information to, to help you get directed if what we do, what we, the actual tests we need to make and so on. But just for general information, this is the, one of the weird little but wonderful little outgrowths of just making pots and trying to get a pot to work. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, everyone who had me.